When I was a little kid, one of the first fossils I ever found was this ammonite. The rocks on the beach near my home were absolutely packed with them and I was absolutely fascinated by them. I needed to know absolutely everything about them. And it was finding things like this when I was a kid that led to me becoming a geologist. And though I've gone on to look at other things, I've never forgot about ammonites and their living relatives, squids and octopuses. So today I'm gonna to teach you all about fossil cephalopods. Let's get started. <laughs> Cephalopods are a type of mollusk, which is the phylum of animals that also includes things like snails, slugs, and clams. As well as squids and octopuses, there are many other kinds of cephalopods still around today. This includes things like cuttlefish and nautiluses, and then some lesser known but just as cool stuff like vampyromorph and argonauts. Regardless whether a cephalopod has a shell or not, they all follow the same basic body plan. They have a muscular foot that's divided into arms or tentacles. They have a fleshy mantle which holds all of their organs and then they have a hard beak which they use for chewing up prey and eating stuff. Cephalopods first appear in the late Cambrian about 500 million years ago. They probably evolved from an ancestor that was a lot like a limpet. You might not know this but modern limpets actually have tentacles as well. So the ancient earliest cephalopods essentially had a flat slightly conical limpet like shell, had lots of chambers in it and they probably use those chambers to give the animal buoyancy as it crawled along the seabed. We don't even know if these early cephalopods actually even had tentacles or arms or not. Eventually, the fact that they had buoyancy led to them being able to float in the water, which then led to them being able to swim using the jet propulsion that's common in all cephalopods today. These earliest true cephalopods were called nautiloids because essentially they were the ancestors of the modern nautilus, but unlike the modern nautilus, which has a nice coiled shell, the ancient nautiloids had long straight shells or slightly curved shells. We generally refer to these as orthocones, which just is a slightly fancy way of saying straight shell. Unlike squids and octopuses, nautiluses don't have arms. They have 60 to 90 little tentacles that, without suckers that are just a bit sticky that they use to sense their surroundings, walk along the seabed, grab bits of food. So early nautiloids probably had a very similar lifestyle hanging around the seabed, snuffling around for things to scavenge and easy prey to eat. So let's start off by comparing the shells of modern nautiluses to fossil nautiluses and nautiloids. Here we have three examples of the nautilus and nautiloids. Got this Ordovician age orthocone nautiloid fossil from Morocco. Got this Cretaceous nautilus fossil, not sure where it's from and then this modern nautilus shell that was responsibly sourced. So we can see the main features of them quite easily now. We can see these are the really simple suture lines. You see the simple suture lines in there. Harder to make out on this one. The Cretaceous nautilus and the modern nautilus are more or less identical internally. We've got these chambers. Uh, they've been filled up now with some calcite. Cephalopod shells are generally made of aragonite, a form of calcium carbonate, but then that recrystallizes to calcite during burial and diagenesis. There's the siphuncle running up the middle. And there's the siphuncle. Well, the siphuncle is actually soft tissue, so it hasn't been preserved in this modern one because it would smell quite bad. But what we hear is this, we see is that little lip called the septal neck. And the scepter are these walls that separate the chambers. So the correct name for the chamber is camera. Here are behind reception in the Earth Science Department. And here's a, a better example of orthocone nautiloid. We've got the long straight shell. We can see now that they've got these body chambers and they aren't solid. You can see the dark areas where there used to be some kind of space in them. It's now being filled in with calcite. And then you've got this dark tube down the middle. That was the siphuncle. And the shell's been a little bit broken and twisted as it's been preserved. And it's in this nice black limestone. So this is Ordovician limestone from Morocco. So just to give you an idea of how abundant these creatures were at their peak. Look how big this bit of stone is. And look how many orthocones there are in it. Isn't that incredible? And when I went to Morocco, they were making all sorts of this. So you could have ashtrays, tables, even toilets made out of this beautiful fossiliferous limestone. And there's a red version as well from the Devonian that's got all, it's actually got uh, goniotites in it too. 
for reasons we're not entirely sure about, some groups of nautiloids went from having a straight, long straight shell and began to develop the tightly coiled shell that's found in modern nautiluses today. It may have been a defense against predation or parasitism. Or maybe they just liked it, who knows? During the Devonian, a new type of shelled cephalopod appeared called the ammonoids. Ammonoids probably evolved from nautiluses with coiled shells in the later Silurian or very earliest Devonian. Position of the siphuncle moved from going through the middle of the shell like nautiluses and nautiloids to along the outside of the shell. Ammonoids came in three main groups that lived at different times throughout their history and are differentiated by the different shapes that the suture lines within their shell take. From the Devonian through to the end of the Permian, the most common type of ammonoid was the goniotite, and their suture pattern is known as goniotitic. So here we have this tiny goniotite fossil. It's maybe Devonian or Carboniferous. And goniotites often had these spheroconic, which basically just means they had ball-shaped shells, very, very tightly curled, coiled. And we're not sure if that was to avoid parasitism or predation, because it protected this bit inside where the, the weak point of the shell was inside the little bit there, it's called the umbilicus. But you can see there, they've got the goniotitic suture lines. Just make that out. Oh, no, it's not going to focus. That's classic goniotite suture lines. From the latest Permian through to the end of the Triassic, the main type of ammonoid was the serotite, and their type of suture was known as serotitic. So here we've got a serotite. This one's Triassic and it's from the Muschelkalk in Germany. And I think it is Serotites is the genus. This is the body chamber. That's where the animal would have lived. And in here was the, uh, the gas and the fluid. You can see the, the scepter again and these sutures. And here we can see the typical serotitic suture lines. They have these lobes and saddles, they're called. And that's fairly stereotypical of the goniotites. This one's interesting, it must have been sat on the seabed for a while, because a lot of these marks, especially on this side here, that's actually part of an oyster shell. So it must be sat there and things have colonized it while it's been on the seabed. And these marks here on the inside in the body chamber are trace fossils where something's dug into the body chamber to use it as a home or maybe to like scavenge out bits of meat that were left over after the animal had died. And then from the Jurassic to the end of the Cretaceous, the main type of ammonoid were ammonites, and they have an ammonitic suture pattern, which is very complex. So now we've got some ammonites. This is Dactylioceros from North Yorkshire, from near where I grew up and found my ammonites when I was a kid. And we can see that the tightly coiled shell is called serpentaconic because it's, it's tightly coiled, but it's not up into a little spherical ball like goniotite was. You can see the whole coil and the whirl. So around Whitby they believed that these were the stone remains of snakes after St Hilda had turned them to stone and thrown them off the cliff when the heads had fallen off. Some people carved little heads onto them, it's very cute. Turn it over and we can see that the ammonite has a really long body chamber so the animal must have been like really long and thin that was uh, living in there. And again here we can see these chambers filled in with calcite and pyrite and sphalerite a little bit there, some zinc sulfate. And there's the scepter separating the camera, the chambers, and you can just see along there is a very thin siphuncle. Yeah, we've got a black line there filled with organic matter that goes round and connects all the chambers. This one, I can't remember the name of, it's from, I think, the gold clay, although it's full of glauconitic sand, so I suspect it's actually from the Cretaceous green sands in southern England. And here we can see the suture pattern. So we couldn't see the suture pattern on that one because there's still shell material there. But here, this crazy kind of fern fractal pattern, that's... That's the ammonitic, typical ammonitic suture line. And if we compare that to the very simple sutures in this nautilus, you can really appreciate the difference. During the Triassic, 
another kind of shelled cephalopod also evolved. This one, a little bit different from the ammonoids and nautiloids though, and that was the belemonites. Belemonite shells generally had two parts, and both of them were actually inside the fleshy mantle of the animal. The first part was a phragma cone, which is a similar buoyancy chamber to that you find in ammonoids, but this was straight. The next part of the shell was a long, solid, calcareous rostrum, which looks like a long bolt, and that was probably used as a ballast. Orthocone nautiloids became extinct at the end of the Permian, and ammonoids became extinct along with belemonites at the end of the Cretaceous. But the nautilus survived, even though today they aren't the most common, and there's only two genus with six species. They're still really cool though. After the end Cretaceous extinction, new types of shelled cephalopods evolved. The most common of these today is probably the cuttlefish. You may not know this, but cuttlefish have an internal phragma cone, which they use to help control their buoyancy. You've probably seen it in uh, pet shops, and that's the cuttle bone that you give to your budgies. There's also a type of squid called spirula that has an internal shell that looks a lot like an ammonoid shell, and it uses that too to control its buoyancy. Lastly, there's the Argonauts, which are a type of octopus. The male is tiny and pretty insignificant, basically just a swimming sperm packet. But the females build these beautiful, delicate, thin shells, which they fill with eggs and then tow around the oceans as they're swimming about. For some reason, in the Cretaceous, ammonites went a little bit strange and developed different shaped shells. And this is a straight-shelled ammonite, an orthocone ammonite, called Baculites. The reason that we know these are ammonites for sure is as you can see on this one, they've got those lovely complex suture patterns. So Baculites had a straight shell, but this is Turulites. There's the opening in the body chamber and the rest of it's missing, had a pointy shell here. Looks like a turritellid snail. So maybe this one was snuffling around on the seabed like this or floating just above it like a weird tentacle castle. That had been pretty terrifying. Imagine being a clam and then this thing comes along. Oh, I'm gonna eat you, oh no. These weird shelled ammonites are called heteromorphs, which just means different shapes. This one's Hamites, and this is from the Cretaceous Galt clay in the southeast of England. And you can see how it has this slightly pearly sheen to it. Well, that's the preservation of the original shell material. So we call that mother of pearl or nacre but it's a type of aragonite, which is a type of calcium carbonate. And in this one, somehow, it's actually been preserved. So this is the body chamber at this end. It's where the animal would have been, but then the shell did this, and then it went down that way and poked back up towards the head. So goodness knows how this one lived. It was floated around like this in the sea, wafting its tentacles, catching plankton, or sort of hung out near the bottom like this. We don't really know what they make. They made these extraordinary beautiful shells and there's not really been anything like them since. So there we go. A quick guide to the types of shelled cephalopods you might find when you're out looking for fossils. I hope you've enjoyed learning about cephalopod fossils today. If you have, leave a thumbs up, share the video with your friends on social media, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any future episodes of Geologic Goodness. Geologic Goodness, okay. <laughs> I guess that's the thing. Let me know in the comments too, have you found any cool cephalopod fossils or are there any kinds of fossils that you'd like me to talk about or make videos on? You can put that down below in the comments. Until next time, thanks for watching, take care, bye bye.